They don't think the middle class exists anymore. To be middle class in America these days, you need to make about $175,000 per year. Why do you think that happened, though? It's slowly becoming just two classes. You either have money or you don't. People listen to what you say. What do you think of this whole, like, meme stock phenomenon? No one's ever going to share how much they lose on social media. You're only seeing the highlights. You have to learn to filter between that. I want to be a millionaire by age 30. Mm. What are the key pieces of advice they should be thinking about? Well, the rich get richer while the poor get poorer. The wealth gap in America has exploded, but Humphrey Yangs figured out how to beat it. Humphrey became wealthy by working normal jobs, by saving tons of money through choices like living at home until age 34, so he could build the financial security to take riskier bets, like founding his own company and launching a successful YouTube channel. Today, Humphrey shares how to beat the system and become a millionaire. And if you enjoy the podcast, we're launching a creator newsletter all about stories like these, industry news, and how to improve as a creator. It's free if you sign up in the next 90 days via the link in description below. Humphrey Yang, thank you so much for making time to coming here onto the podcast. Yes, thank you for having me, Eric. Always yeah. good to see you thank in you, LA, thank you. your beautiful house. I very much appreciate that. Humphrey, do you ever sit down when you wake up right out of bed in the morning, do you look at yourself in the mirror and say, this is the face of the man that is more trusted by Gen Z than Warren Buffett for financial advice. <laughs> no, I never do that. Because I would. I feel pretty good about myself. And yet that's true with you. You know, that was a really interesting article when it came out. And I think it was a really great headline. Maybe Gen Z doesn't even know who Warren Buffett is. So that's a possible reason. But I'm trying to remain, remain humble about it. But uh, I would still definitely trust Warren Buffett for investing advice over me. Why do you think that happened, though? I'm not sure. I think that sometimes, you know, you get a lot of press just because you are on the Internet. It's possible that maybe the majority of Gen Z just saw me more times on TikTok in from years 2020 yeah. to 2023. And they're like, oh, Humphrey, you know, it's kind of like. I don't know. It's like if you see someone so many times, you just get familiar with their face. But I think it kind of goes to like a lot of how money investing has changed over the past few years, right? Like mm. Warren is well known because he's a billionaire yeah. who's invested in so many companies. People follow his advice on how to invest in the markets. Sure. You have millions of followers on social media where you've talked about, hey, you saved $100,000 by age 26 that you're a millionaire, mm -hmm. but you lived with your parents until you were age 34. Weirdly, for this new generation, say 25 and younger, you're the first person that they see. Now, when you were the age of Gen Z, did you ever see yourself in this path? I didn't see myself necessarily in the past in the path of a YouTuber or TikToker just because social media wasn't as big when I was like, let's say 24. Mm -hmm. But I did see myself being some sort of entrepreneur or having my own business by the time I was 30. And so like that was just like this arbitrary number that I really wanted to hit, which, which was like have my own business by the time I was 30 years old. And I, so I actually quit my job, which we'll talk about in 2016. And I was 28 at the time and I started a business. And so uh, the first business that I ever started was just a poster selling business. We would sell posters online. Why? When did you realize you wanted to do something a little bit less conventional, less corporate? Yeah. So when I was like eight or nine or 10, we sold, uh, sodas to construction workers. That was, that was like my first entrepreneurial activity. I just wanted a way to make extra money so I could buy video games down the street from my house where I grew up. There was a construction site cause they were building a new house. So I'd bring a cooler down there with like a bunch of Sprites and Cokes and Gatorades and stuff that we bought from Costco and I would just flip it. And thankfully my dad and my mom really helped me with that. Like they took me to Costco, we would buy the sodas and then, you know, whenever they are working throughout the workday, I would go down there and post up and I'd sell these sodas for two, bu two bucks, <laughs> which was a lot of money you, back you then. You were profiteering <laughs> off yeah. these poor construction workers. They were sweating <laughs> after a heavy day's worth of labor and they come yeah. by and this, this little Asian kid, it's like, you, you want a soda? Yeah. And this was, also, this was also like 1997. So no one had, let's say, cashless payments yet. Everyone still had cash, which was great. And so I was running a cash business. Oh my gosh. On the side of the road. And it was good. And so that was like the first taste of entrepreneurship I got. And then in high school, I ran like the, the school's like student body snack shack. I was the treasurer. And so I would go, same thing, I would go on the weekends to Costco, load up, and then I would 
run this snack shack shack for the school and we would you know mark up certain items a certain amount and sell them during the breaks and recesses and that was fun when you were realizing hey i really like hustling and bustling mm-hmm. and running my own business and one day i wanted to do this more full-time what element of it really appealed to you it was mostly independence and like a little bit more freedom and i never really liked i i did some internships in college uh, for banks. And then I also worked in, in the corporate world after college. And I just didn't really like the whole lifestyle of you have to report somewhere. And then you, you were kind of there for a certain amount of time and you couldn't really dictate your own hours. Mm. So a lot of it is like freedom driven for me. And I think I really value like flexibility of time in my yeah. life. And so that's one of the main reasons I wanted to become an entrepreneur. And I also just like betting on myself uh, more so than like I guess other people would, and I'm willing to take that risk. But I also had a lot of opportunities to do that because I lived at home Mm. because my dad kind of fostered this like environment of like, you know, you can live at home for as long as you want. You don't have to pay rent. Um, So I do acknowledge that I had a lot of like advantages throughout my life because of that. And also because my dad, you know, by the time I was born, he had already established himself. He wasn't, we weren't super successful by any means, but we were, um, not let's say middle class, maybe upper middle class at that point. So growing up, did you think of yourself as a child as rich or poor? Or you just had the sense like we just don't think about money or we don't talk about it. My dad would talk about money all the time. He still does. Uh, he grew up really poor, no money at all, not yeah. not enough money for food, and so for him, money is a scarce resource that we talk about all the time. He's always complaining about how much everything costs. We try to we try to cut costs everywhere as a family, um, so it was something that was always talked about at home, which is probably why I'm so interested in finance. Number one, mm-hmm. um, number two, we did have enough money, so it's not like we were gonna go, we weren't gonna make the next paycheck or the next bill or anything like that. So that was not a huge worry of ours. However, uh, it was still on our mind all the time. Like, how can we make more? How can we save more? My dad Mm. also grew up in poverty in China. Mm -hmm. And it's like the classic story. Like he learned English from like reading school books that were thrown out onto the street. Yeah. And the number one thing he cared about more than anything was money and providing a stable financial background for my mom, myself, and my brother. I've resented it for a long time Mm. because it felt like money was not just an important thing. It was the only important thing. Every decision in my life was guided around, will this make me more money in the future? The classes that I took were meant to prepare me to go into finance and become a future investment banker. The friends that I made were supposed to be ones who could be promising future colleagues in business or came from rich families Mm. because he was, I think, so scared of what happens if Eric gets older and he's not able to do this. Yeah, I agree. I know I mean, you previously mentioned in interviews too, like you, when you graduated, one of the reasons why you went into finance for a bit was because of your dad's influence on you. Yeah, it's very true. I mean, we have very similar backgrounds, I, I bet, growing up, like money was a big, big focus for that. And so I studied finance in college and I felt like, you know, my dad worked in finance for a very brief stint, very, mm. very brief. But I remember going into his office and thinking, oh, like I could do finance one day too. And so I really wanted to prove to him that I could do some sort of financial job. And that's why I got a role as a financial advisor first and foremost. And then I actually did an internship with investment banking as well, um, just to try it, Mm. which was nice, but it also kind of made me realize I don't really love it, love that type of setting. I liked finance, like personal finance, but I don't love, let's say, corporate finance. When you're is working as a financial advisor, Humphrey, you're mm-hmm. what, like 23 years old? I'm like 25. So I like also 25. didn't have a lot of like authority to be advising older people on like how they should manage their money. Yeah, you know, just like you're all. like the 10-year-old yeah. selling Sprite to three sheet construction workers. You're a 25-year-old. You're making what, like 40, 50K a year as a financial advisor? Yeah, 50, 55-ish. And then you're supposed to start making money via commission so in a four-year program. You were incentivized program. to try and get people to buy into your financial products. Yes, correct. You always want to do something of your own. Mm-hmm. You also want to do something in finance because of your dad, you've now found yourself into this perfect mix between these two worlds. Yes. And at the time, I didn't realize that that type of experience would serve me later. And I think that's really true for a lot of things in life. You might go through something, you don't really see the point of it in the moment, but maybe looking back or maybe later on, it serves you in some sort of 
righteous way or karmic way. And so mm. that's, that's actually very fascinating that I kind of married the two things that I was interested in, which was let's try finance and also let's do something for myself. And now it's a perfect blend of the two. How planned was this? Trying social media was very planned. Mm -hmm. Identifying that I wanted to do TikTok was very planned. And then working consistently on it was very planned. However, I was not planning that I would, like, let's say when I was 25, I wasn't planning to be a social media person, right? Yeah. But I did not I did enjoy watching social media at the time, so it was an interest. So it's more just like where my interests kind of aligned and then where I thought that I could fit into the market, I suppose. Now as a full-time financial creator, mm -hmm. how much are you worth? Hi there. If you're enjoying the podcast and want to hear more creator stories like these, or you're a creator looking to level up and improve, or you just want to track everything happening in the news that affects you, like is TikTok being banned or not, I'm launching a newsletter that's all about creators and free for the next 90 days if you sign up via link below. Now back to the podcast. Now as a full-time financial creator, mm -hmm. how much are you worth? So I think right before I was a financial creator, I was probably worth right under a million net worth. That's and great. that's with investments, right? Because I had been investing for a while, as well as the job that I worked at was a tech job where I was making quite a good salary and I was saving it all because I was living at home. So this was like compounding. So I was right under that. And then now that I'm a financial creator, uh, you know, I've probably like doubled that, maybe that's a little amazing. bit more. Yeah. How does it feel knowing that half the people you meet are going to be thinking, how much does Humphrey make? How much oh. is Humphrey worth? I don't even know how many people would think that. Do people, you think that's like the first You're thing? You're a financial creator. Like the number one thing financial creators yeah. always talk about is here's how I made 100,000. Here's how I True. made a million. Here's how I'm worth 5 million. Because funnily enough, you're in a position where, you know, maybe as a 25 year old, as a financial advisor, you don't have that much authority guiding mm -hmm. people in financial mm -hmm. decisions. Now you have more authority than Warren Buffett. People do look to you as to what to do, whether they know it or not, they're thinking through, how should I know he's good at what he does? Yeah, and I guess you could say m money is one of the proof points that you could look at as a, yeah. for a financial creator. It's also a very intimate thing to be asking about tradition. I would never ask anybody else, how much are you worth? Right, right. But weirdly, I feel comfortable asking you. I am mostly transparent with it. Yeah. <laughs> and okay. I also made a video last year on how much I've made throughout my entire YouTube career. Mm. And how much in AdSense we made last year, which was right over $300,000, which wow. was crazy. Just AdSense alone, right? You're in an industry where you're evaluated off of not just potentially mm. how much you're worth, but also like views, how many followers, how many likes. Is this something that's changed how you think about yourself or you're more like, mm, actually, it doesn't really matter? Yeah, obviously I would be lying if I said that the views don't impact my personality, not my personality, but my confidence in some mm -hmm. sort of way. Like it's nice to know that you're being validated on social platforms by the type of uh, content you create that's educational and valuable. Um, and so it's definitely given me a, a lot of confidence, I would say, in the past three to four years. It's like knowing that, okay, especially on YouTube where like success is gauged by a number of views, it's like, okay, like this guy's got something going on. He's He's doing something right. And so, yeah, I try not to get attached to the numbers, but mm -hmm. it's very human nature to avoid them, right? Like it's almost human nature that you want to look at the numbers and say, okay, look how many views I got, you know, <laughs> this is great. But it's probably bad for your mental health to always be obsessed with the numbers for sure. Do you remember the first time you looked at your views and how much you're making from social media and you're like, I can do this full time? Yeah, I do. It was November, 2020. Uh, I had been doing TikTok for almost a full year at that time, a video every day on TikTok. And that wow. got me to like about a million How followers. How long did you do a video a day for? 265 straight days. That's insane. On TikTok. But it was also pandemic, so it was a lot easier to make a video a day. But I was also new at video creation. So like making a video a day is work. It's work. And it was like coming up with an idea every day was tough. And so, um, but right in, in November, 2020, my YouTube channel started to make about $1,000 a month on AdSense. Mm. And plus the TikTok revenue that I was getting from like a brand deal here and there. I was like, okay, I can probably make this my full-time job if I double down. And so that's what I did. Mm -hmm. But then I just kept going. And my goal at the end of 2020 was to get 10,000 followers, which was really funny because I wrote that goal in 2019. I was like, I want 10,000 followers mm. on TikTok or like 1,000 YouTube subscribers. It was my other goal in 2020. And uh, it just shows you like if you work at something every single day and you get better a little bit every day, it'll... I think your results will come. You've also talked about on that mention mm -hmm. of goals, like you did save $100,000 by what was like age 26 yeah. or something. Yeah. So 
there are so many people who follow you for financial advice. Someone comes to you, let's say not even a hundred thousand, say they're like, yeah, I want to be a millionaire by age 30. Mm. What are the key pieces of advice and things that you tell them they should be thinking about? I read this book called The Millionaire Next Door. I've read that book or I was actively reading that book in the last month. And it's all about not only is it increasing your offense, which they, they like to call income generation, but your defense has to be solid, which means you can't be spending that much money. And that's actually one of the reasons why people are such under accumulators of wealth is that their defense is poor, AKA they spend too much money. And you might be making a million bucks a year, but if you're spending $900,000 of that, are you really, you know, are you really accumulating wealth? Probably not. I think it's a combination of, okay, let's get your skills up so that you have some sort of income generating skill, whether that be at your job or outside of your job or entrepreneurial wise. And then let's make sure that our spending's in check by tracking it. When I look at social media today, mm -hmm. I feel it is all about offense. Like you yeah. go to these Reddit posts about Wall Street bets mm -hmm. or meme stocks or crypto. Everyone is thinking so much about how do I just make so much more money? And I think it's partially because everyone seems to be getting richer, but you don't hear mm. much about the defense part about like, oh, well, you have to have like consistent, good, frugal habits. Mm -hmm. When you look at the social media landscape and it's so flooded, like over the past few years, like literally there've been multiple movies now made, like dumb money on how finance has <laughs> yeah. changed. Like, what do you think of this whole like meme stock phenomenon where everyone's just jumping on each other to give each other financial advice on how to just make more? It's definitely very pervasive and prevalent across social media and you know just like social media is with people's lives like you're only seeing the highlights no one's ever going to share how much they lose on social media you know how much that they've lost on certain bets or certain investments etc you're only going to see their wins mm. so it's like you have to learn to filter between that if you're watching someone's instagram and you're like okay this guy's made a hundred thousand dollars the first thought shouldn't be like, oh, how can I be like him or her? It should be like, okay, but how much did he lose? Is he actually telling me the truth? Should I do some more research into this person and actually find out if they are a trusted source or not? Sometimes you can see underlying motives of somebody who's trying to promote something. They're just like trying to show off all the time. So whenever I see someone showing off all the time, I, I always get a little skeptical at first. And I do think like that's kind of like the, the dangerous part of social media, especially for someone who's Gen Z or younger is they might think that making money is super, super easy and super comes quickly. But, um, you know, that's just, you gotta be realistic. And you know that, I'm sure you know that it's hard to build a business and it's hard yeah. to make money. And so I think people need a, a kind of a, rea a reality check from social media sometimes. To me, you almost feel like the anti-hype financial influencer and in that you're sure. like, hey guys, like I'm worth a couple million. I'm not worth like $500 million. No. And most of this I got because I made smart, prudent life decisions. You're not advocating, go all in on crypto, go all in on meme no. stocks. And in a way that does emulate Warren Buffett's mantras as well. It's like playing it very fundamentally and basic in a world where everyone's trying to sell you get rich quick. Yep, it's very boring. You also describe <laughs> yourself, <laughs> it's very boring, but like boring, It, but it works. It works. I mean, I'm not gonna sit here and be like, okay, all I'm doing is boring stuff. I yeah. have like- 5% of my money in crypto, right? And like 2.5% of that, I'll just like- Where, Where's most of your money? It's mostly in stocks or just cash. Why so much cash? Yeah, so cash is an interesting thing. I initially had a lot of, I have about 30% of my entire portfolio sitting in cash. And initially I just wanted this cash to buy a home in California, which you need a lot of cash for down payment. I also like would like to put more than 20% down to mm -hmm. kind of lower my payments. But these days with the interest rates so high with mortgages, I'm kind of thinking about holding back on that for a little bit and seeing if I can just like maybe do something else with that cash or just kind of put, right now it's just in high yield savings. So it's earning five, five-ish percent. Mm -hmm. So I don't feel bad about that. Obviously I could probably maximize it by putting it all in the market. But I think having some cash on the sidelines affords you a lot of opportunities mm. that you might not otherwise be able to pursue. For example, if you had a lot of cash and you were working at a job you didn't really like, you might feel a little bit more comfortable, you know, quitting that job and then maybe working on something of your own, giving it a try for three to six months. Whereas if you didn't have that cash, you might be able to feel really tied to that job and like you can't quit. Um, I just think it offers you a lot of opportunities that are intangible opportunities and they might not be the best financial decisions, 
However, intangibly, I think it's a good peace of mind thing to have. I kind of like that because, again, from a financial POV, maybe mm-hmm. you can make more by putting it in markets or you could take like huge risky bets, like mm-hmm. putting it in some random asset class that goes to the moon. But you're talking a lot, again, about life decisions. And I know for myself, today I co-founded and run a startup. It's yeah. an extremely risky decision that so far financially is actually working out. I never would have had the metal to go for it if I hadn't built substantial savings already sure. working in corporate America. I worked as a consultant. I worked in banking. I worked as a product manager for five, six, seven years. And that's finally at age 28 when I said, hmm, I can afford to make bigger risks now because there's that little bit of cushion. And so I kind of like you're describing as long as you have cash and you've built something up, it mentally frees you to Mm -hmm. go and do things that you wanted to, but you might've felt a little bit scared about. I definitely agree. I think a lot of what we're talking about right here is that sometimes the right financial decision is not the most psychologically pleasing one, Mm. if that makes sense. Like, yeah, I could risk all my cash in the market, but psychologically that might actually hurt my peace of mind. And so sometimes the right peace of mind decision is not the right financial decision, if that makes sense. And you got to kind of figure out if you want to balance that, how you want to balance that, how comfortable are you with that? Um, Personally, I enjoy peace of mind way more than I enjoy like optimizing, min-maxing, if you will, Mm -hmm. my financial decisions by like one or 2%, right? Like if the average in the market is 8% and I'm getting 5% from my high yield savings, is that 3% extra worth my peace of mind for the next two to three years? I think I'd rather have the peace of mind of having that cash. However, over 30 years, then we're talking something different. So it's kind of like a trade-off. You always have to kind of do the math yourself and figure out if it works for you. You've also made trade-offs in your own life to try and build those savings. Sure. I've heard you mention in previous pods, like you didn't date for a very, very long time. Because <laughs> that was not were, by choice. <laughs> well, you were, you were living out of your dad's house until you were, you were 34, which was a financial yep. decision that helped you build the cushion to make riskier decisions like be a YouTuber. Okay, so I will say this. Definitely not by choice. Definitely want to date. If you're single, hit me up. But let me let me say this. This is the face of Gen Z Warren Buffett. Why why <laughs> wouldn't right. you want to date Humphrey here? So I did move out for a year. I did try San Francisco in 2017 for a year. I had two roommates, still pretty new to dating at that time. But even when I was living at home, I kind of rationalized it because my dad was in Asia a lot. That, oh, I kind of have the home to myself. You know, I'm home nine months out or He's gone nine months out of the year. I have the home to myself three months, three to six months out of the year. That's how I would sell it to women I was dating. Be like, um, I have three quarters of a home. Yeah, exactly. My dad's usually not here. Exactly. However, what I realize now that now that I've moved to San Francisco for the better part of 11 months now, like fully in my own place, one bedroom and everything like that, I realized like how primitive I was in that thinking and it took me a very long time. So that was a big trade-off, yes. It's funny it because I don't know if you remember, we chat every now and then, yeah. usually over text, yeah. but like a year and a half ago, I messaged you because you popped up on a dating app. Really? And me? Yeah. Which and one? I don't remember. Why I were you, why'd you, you find bumble. me? What? I messaged you. I was like, <laughs> we can literally pull up the receipts. I will, we'll probably post oh, a screenshot God. and blur it. Please don't. One of my friends, my classmates from Harvard is uh, like, hey, do you know Humphrey? Uh, is he single? Yes. So I don't know what you're talking about. You're a hot commodity to where other people are messaging me about you. Well, thank you. But you made keep a- sending, Keep sending Keep sending I will. Yeah, but, <laughs> you know, of course, you made a conscious decision, yeah. though, to prioritize the financial stability so that now you can live a little. True. Very true. Yeah. Because of the nature of what you do, they might be thinking about that more. So when you're meeting people also even in a romantic context, like, do you tell them like, I'm a financial creator? I will tell them I'm a creator. And if they ask me what I make on uh, videos on or content on, I say finance, but no one really knows how much that pays. I I get a lot of ranging like opinions. Some people think it pays a hundred K a year. Some people think it pays less. Some people think it pays more. It just really depends on who you're talking to. And I think as long as like you're not, like I don't want to send the wrong signal with like the first date. Like I'm not going to take you to like a two-star Michelin restaurant. You know what I mean? On your first date. But I want to set reasonable expectations, but still am able to provide for the dates and also take them on nice experiences. Um, But don't think that you're going to get like, you know, 
floor seats to the Golden State Warriors on our first date. I don't have that much money, or, you know, or I don't want to tell them do you, I have do that you, much money. I don't know. Do you? I don't have that much money, guys. Just, I love your like really possible don't. defense if you watch this. I just don't. It's not that I don't want it. It's I couldn't. Well, do you pay for dinner though, the first date? I pay for all the dates up to like date five. After date five, then maybe we we could you start splitting it. They could buy an ice cream. Oh, okay. So yeah. it's not like it has to be equal, but you just want something. I would prefer to pay for most of the dates, 75, 80% yeah. of the dates, yeah. Oh, why is yeah. that? I don't know. I just think it's the right thing to do for as, as a do, male. Do you see that? A gentleman, ladies, <laughs> a gentleman. Do you think of yourself, like, now you've built up this financial cushion, right? Mm -hmm. You've already shared your net worth is in the millions. You said you grew up upper middle class. Yep. And how do you consider yourself today? Do you think of yourself as middle class? Or do you think of yourself as rich? I think of myself still as... Okay, well, first of all, we need to talk about the middle class because I don't think the middle class exists anymore. What do you mean by that? So back in 1950, the average median... Sorry, the median income was $3,300 per year for the average household, okay? The median income, $3,300. And the house... Wait, 3300 US dollars. Like $3,300. Yeah, but it was 1950. Still, that's... Really low. Yeah, it sounds really low until you realize yeah. that the median home price back then was about $7,500. Only a little bit more than double. Right. So it would take you two years of your wages to buy a home. Mm -hmm. These days, the median income, household income is $70,000 or thereabouts. And the right. median house, which is 430000 oh. By the way, that's not even the median house in California. That's the median house in the United States is 430000 That's like six and a half years of wages it's fucked up that is messed up and the funny the the worst thing is is that i just watched this this video the other day that to be middle class in america these days you need to make about one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars per year and not many people make one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars per year even as a combined household wow. yes so i don't think the middle class exists anymore i think it's slowly becoming just two classes it's like you either have money or you don't and you know they're a lot of people will always pander to, okay, this is what we need to do to the, from the a lot of politicians will say, this is what we need to do to fix the middle class. But until they really fix this issue of like prices spiraling out of control, not keeping up with wages, then I don't really think that we have a middle class. Anymore. Why do you think this chasm has emerged? Like I remember reading, there's this economist out there named Thomas Piketty and he put out mm -hmm. this book. I've never actually read it but I've read enough of the Wikipedia summary to tell you his whole point is returns on capital exceed returns on labor. And all that means mm. is yep. someone who has invested and bought an asset, for example, a house, the rent they get from utilizing that asset exceeds how much money people get from literally working. Correct. So in my mind, that means if you're fortunate enough to already have some capital, to have some assets, the returns you get from deploying it outpace people who don't have it who are just working and trying to get there and so over time the returns end up creating this gap where capital owners just have more and more and more correct that is a potential cause for what we talked about before everyone on social media is aggressive go diamond hands and put all of your money <laughs> yeah. into shibu inu coins because mm -hmm. that's going to go to the moon because there's this unconscious realization, like, I need to also own things to try and bridge that gap. When meme stock happened, for example, with GameStop, is this something that you participated in? Did you buy any GameStop stock? Oh, yeah. I mean, so what's interesting is, is that I bought GameStop stock, say that four times fast. I know, wow, tongue twister. In November of 2019. And that's because one of my friends who's a stock trader... He always just get, trust me, you don't want a friend that's a stock trader. He'll always I mean, tell kind, you. kind of sounds amazing to have a friend who's a stock trader. He got you in a GameStop in 2019. True. But he'll always send me a pick, okay? I get oh, a gosh. Google chat almost every morning. What's his record? Like, if you did, if you had bought all of his picks, would you be up or down? No idea. I'm probably sure you would be down. Sorry, Andrew. But what what what's interesting was the one pick that he gave me that he was quite bullish on was GameStop in November of 2019. So I bought, you know, like 500,000 shares. It was 12 bucks. It was 12 bucks a share, right? So I bought like $5,000 worth of it. Sorry, 5,000 5, divided by 12. What's that? 500 shares? Okay. -ish. So you bought $5,000 worth of GameStop in November 2019. 2019. And I also bought one call option. Wow. Which was great. And so I ended up making like 60 grand on GameStop when it like went up. But 
here's the thing, Andrew, I've lost a lot of money since because of the random stock picks I might get. So that's where I want to be. I'd rather be just boring and conservative because it's not volatile. It's not very emotional. It's not going to go up and down like crazy. I just want something boring that consistently kind of makes you return over time. And I think that's the best way to invest is just to forget your investment, like investment brokerage password. That's what Morgan Housel says in The Psychology of Money. He's a big proponent on just like forgetting your mm. password and just like leaving it in Like you can't look fund. at it. You can't react to the markets too much. Yeah, you don't want to react to the markets. But yeah. back to your point, I definitely think you do need to play a lot of offense in order to get that capital because capital scales really well. Mm. Capital scales well, code scales really well, and media scales really well. Like this podcast we're doing, we're only doing it one time. But it might be viewed one time. It could be viewed 10,000 times. Or I a hope it's more times. than one time, Humphrey. Right? <laughs> I'm going to watch my own podcast 10 times at least. Yeah, but it could be viewed a million times. Yeah. So for this return on our time, on your time right now, it could be exponential. Mm -hmm. And that's a concept from Naval Ravikant, which I don't know, you've probably listened yeah, to. Yeah, he was before. also the founder of AngelList. Yes. That was actually one of the reasons I started social media. It's like, I'm not a coder. I don't have a ton of capital to scale, so maybe I can just try media yeah. because media scales well. It's like in a world where the capitalistic mechanisms are falling apart, where mm -hmm. the rich are literally getting richer because they own things. If you're growing up middle class, which you did, and frankly, I did as well for a long time, how do you bridge the gap? You have to think about how do I get assets? And it can't yeah. necessarily be just by working with people. You, in addition to doing that and building savings and being frugal, you have to find your own leverage, as you said, through code or capital or media. Yeah, I will say that you can still make a lot of money in a corporate world, mm. right? You can okay. still rise through the ranks and you can also job hop in order to get better titles. Yeah, that's the better best pay. way to get pay raises is by leaving and going to another company. Yeah. So actually, uh, your rich BFF, I don't know if she was on your podcast. She was, yes. Did she say that there was a Forbes study where if you switch jobs, you actually make 50% more pay wow. over the course of 10 years? So the, the Forbes study is actually underrepresenting that. You actually, that's based on a 10% raise every time you switch jobs every two years. But if I'm sure you know in technology or in some of these hot sectors, you can get more like a 15 or 20% raise every two years. How many times did you switch jobs before you became a YouTuber? Four Four, Four times. times. And so you started off, I know, initially doing customer support at Kabam, a gaming company. Mm -hmm. How much were you making then? $40,000 a year. 40000 Then yep. you did financial advisor. 50000 a year. Yeah, more like 50000 with commission potentially higher. Right. After that, you went and briefly worked in investment banking internship. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if we can really count that as a job. I won't count that. Then you went to Machine Zone. Yep which became a unicorn-valued gaming company that yep. then later actually dropped in valuation and sold for less than the options were probably priced at. How much were you making there? Yeah, so when I first went to Machine Zone, my friend told me about it. I was, you know, I probably was making 50, 55K at the financial advisory mm -hmm. firm. Uh, they had a job for me that was like 17 or 18 bucks an hour. It was a QA oh, job. Wow. So I actually took a pay cut to go there. But I knew it was a good opportunity because it was Y Combinator backed. And back then, it was Y Combinator class of like 2009 or 2010, yeah, really, yeah. which was like the same class as like Dropbox and some of these like, and Stripe. And so it was like a very high quality company. And so I took a pay cut knowing that it was a better, it was a better company. I was probably within the first hundred employees. And within that year of joining, I'd say four or five months later, they had a role open up, which was like monetization monetization analyst, if you will, because they were doing, they started a live operations team, which just basically meant looking at real time data and figure out what players wanted within this mobile video game and selling them packages, in game packages. So it's like, I'm playing this app where I don't know, I'm like staffing my castle to fight against yeah. other people's castles. And it's live service like, hey, do you want to buy like a bundle of cannons for like 15 real dollar dollars? Right. On the hour, every hour, we had a wow. new sale. And what was interesting was once they turned on this type of monetization, like the game just like, I don't know, 10 or 100 X its revenue, right? And so the, the team, the company grew from like 100 employees while I was there in year one my first year there, but it was already year five of the company. But the next year they had like 400 employees. Mm. The year after that, they had 2000 employees, so right? You took a bet on seeing a company that you thought could grow exponentially, starting off in customer service, essentially mm -hmm. 17, $18 an hour. 
that monetization position, how much was it paying you? I think the start, yeah, the starting was 75K. So immediately like my salary like doubled within the same organization, which was nice, but it's a completely different role. But that's also because I had someone of a background in gaming already. Yeah. And it's because I also had a finance degree. So it definitely helped a little bit. So that role opened up, which was fortuitous, right? And then within three to six months, they raised me to 85K a year. So an extra 10K. And then the company was doing so well six months later that they bumped me up to 100K. That's crazy. Plus you have the stock options, which let's not talk about it because they, they weren't worth anything. However, you got options. And then uh, about, I would say nine months later, my salary went up to 140K. Mm. So, you know, promotion promotions came quickly. And so within that certain job, I didn't have a need to switch jobs just it, because it was I was getting- It was a startup. It was yeah, growing so fast. It was growing so fast. But I would say for someone who's in a more traditional corporate role, yeah, if you can switch jobs every two to three years, especially early on in yeah. your career, you can really boost your income by a lot. When I think back, so when I graduated, I went to Harvard, mm -hmm. I studied economics, mm -hmm. very similar to yourself because, you know, I had a dad who really wanted me to be financially stable. I internalized that. I was like, the most important thing I need to do is like go and make money. Yep. And I interned in my junior year at Blackstone. Ooh. And had I joined Blackstone, which I did get an offer, I would have made, gosh, I don't remember exactly. I would have made at least, I think, $120,000 a year. Okay. Like straight out of the gate as what, like a 22-year-old. What year was this? This was uh, 2014. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was after the financial crisis. I know you actually graduated in the financial yeah, crisis. Sucked. There aren't yeah. a lot of jobs in finance. I graduated in 2014. So yeah, right off the bat, I could have been making like 120 k plus. I actually really didn't like it. I ended up reneging on my offer and I took a job at McKinsey instead of a consulting firm where the salary was lower. It was around 70, 75,000. What happened was I spent about a couple of years at McKinsey and then I went to Facebook. I went to Meta mm. and became an early product manager there. My salary immediately jumped base from like 70K to like 100K. Mm, nice. And there's also like equity options too that I think restricted stock units, which I think were worth like 50K. So I basically jumped from... I don't know, like 75K to like 150, 150, although the 50K split over four years, more like, you know, like 110, sure. 115. And then essentially every quarter, every half, you could potentially get promoted. So then I was promoted. My salary jumped again. I think my new base was like 150K or my something. God. And had I stayed longer, could have jumped to 200. And that's when I decided similarly to, I know what you did after Machine Zone. I was like, let's go and try and do a startup company thing in Shake instead. <laughs> Basically, my salary dropped <laughs> yeah. to like, I think the first, well, initially my co-founder and I weren't like really paying ourselves at all, but the first salary I think we paid, I think it was like 70,000. So mm -hmm. I basically took a giant step back yeah. in. What about for yourself? I know you started a company after Machine Zone. Like what was the context behind it? Why did you do it? Well, b besides the fact that I just wanted to be an entrepreneur and start my own business before the age of 30, that yeah. was that was the main reason. There was wh why maps? You sold posters and maps. Uh, wasn't my idea. Mm. Uh, a friend of mine, a friend of a friend of mine came to me and was like, "Hey, they're doing these maps in Europe. We should do the same thing in the United States." And I was so hungry and desperate for some sort of idea to work on at the time that I was like, "Let's do it." Wow. So and you so, were so ready. You're like, I need to do something. I had no ideas though. Huh. In hindsight, maybe I should have just done YouTube from the start, but I'm glad that I did the the maps business because I actually grew an Instagram from the maps business. And so not many people know this, but I had a meme account first, right? I was just messing around. I had a, I have a friend of mine from my same area. He was running one of the a bigger meme accounts mm -hmm. um, just on the internet. He was a funny guy. So he had a you know he had a meme account called Gucci Game Boy. Gucci Game Boy. Yeah, it was a, it was a really funny meme account. And so I was like, I saw Matt doing this. I was like, oh, I want to do the same thing. So I made a meme account first about, about like maps. About what? No, just like I would just create memes for fun. Like I create what like of uh, memes? conversation memes were really good. Okay. Like uh, like I had this one. <laughs> there's this one stock photo of like this girl and a guy on a date. The guy asked the girl. Your profile says that you like finishing other people's sentences. And she says, yes. And he's like, well, great. I just finished a sentence for manslaughter. And I, it was uh, funny. Uh, it's hey. kind of a dark joke, but it did it did well. So I made a lot of those those memes. And so I grew an Instagram page in 2016 or 10, 2017 to 10,000 followers. And this is like outside your company. You're just like yes. writing a meme this is just outside the company. on the side but for my, fun. Yeah. My goal with the meme page was to eventually just like do influencer ads 
for my own company on the meme page. This is the big brain play. Yes. And so I knew all the memers too, because they knew me as the smaller memer guy. And so I would actually, the way that we scaled that first business was buying influencer ads with meme pages in 2017 and 2018. Wow. And we had one posted by Men's Humor, did really well. Mm -hmm. This guy named Head Steve posted us once for a lot of money, but Actually, the first one he did for free, which was really nice. nice but um, we made we made not, money. Not not much of a shit at actually. It's like polite, well natured Steve. <laughs> polite Steve. But yeah, so that's that's kind of how I did it. But I also took a big pay cut. I went from one hundred forty thousand dollars per year to basically pay myself nothing. And in the first year, I think I paid myself thirty thousand dollars. And but I was living at home, so my costs were still. Up. Wait, but like, how do you make the context of an extremely risky startup decision? When you're talking a lot about you got to play defense, like you got to build up savings, mm. you want to be financially responsible, and you're like, and that's why I took a pay cut from $140,000 to nothing. Yeah, I guess what I viewed was like I could get bigger offense down the road if mm. if I worked on this business and it was successful. Um, and if not, I have a huge learning lesson. I feel like if you're learning things consistently all the time, your offense, your offensive potential grows. Uh, I was still playing heavy defense. I was not making, or I was not spending that much money. Yeah, I was you you at had home. savings. And I had savings, yeah. I kind of, makes a lot of sense to me. You could take the risky decision because you'd been defensive before. Yep. Mm. And so how did that business go? So that business was interesting. We did probably like 500K in revenue the first year. Oh, that's, just a, on that's a lot. Ads. 500K. Yep. It's like multiple six figures. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the profit margin was about 15%. So we didn't make that much money. Okay. What's that? Like 75K? Yeah. 75K. Um, and then th that's why I paid myself 30K. It My other sense. partner got some. And then the next year did like 840K revenue. Mm. Similar profit margins, but 15, 20%. And then the last final year was 2019. I think it did. It was on pace. We did about 650 or 700 or so. Very cool. I think in total, it was probably like 1.8 million, 500, 800. Yeah. yeah about those 1, 8 numbers, 1, honestly, are better than like 85% of what I hear on Shark Tank. Well, we got really lucky. And yeah, I think most businesses aren't profitable after three years. Yeah. So it, it and not nice. to mention your secret meme account led to yeah. the meme influencer networking, which led to yes. advertisements for the maps and poster business. Exactly. It's, it's like truly it kind of came together. Everything comes together. But also because I had that confidence of growing the meme account, yeah. I knew that I could grow a social media page. Uh, so at that point in 2019, I was trying a bunch of different things and I was like, okay, I can I can try YouTube. I might not be good at YouTube, but I know I can grow a page if I'm just consistent. That's where the consistency came part, mm -hmm. came up a part of it. But I made three YouTube videos in 2019. They went nowhere. What were they about? The first one was an intro. The second one Wait, was- Wait, what's an intro video? You're just like, hey, I'm Humphrey. Come hey, watch my yeah, channel. Yeah, why, why I'm starting the channel. Oh, okay, so uh, no actual content other than I'm Humphrey and you should watch this. Yeah, yeah, it's still up on the channel if nice. you want. It's not very good at all. Don't watch it. Uh, and then it was a video where I reviewed someone's finances. They sent me like, it's almost like Caleb Hammer pre-Caleb yeah. Hammer. It was someone sent me all of their bank statements and I just kind of. Wait, that like, sounds like an amazing concept. Yeah, it was. It took a lot of work. Yeah, it's a lot of uh, work. And Respect it takes to Caleb. Yeah, it, and it takes a lot. It takes someone to give you their bank statements yeah. and credit card statements and want to be audited in that way. Mm. So I did that. So who is this rando who is like, yeah, Humphrey, uh, here's all my financial information. Like we talked about money is a very intimate subject. Yeah. I used to go to this cafe a lot in Menlo Park called Cafe Baroni. And it was one of the baristas there. And his name was Joe. He doesn't work there anymore, but he was really nice. And he was trying to improve his own finances, but didn't want to go through the hassle of like tracking his own expenses. So I said, listen, for a video, I'll do it for you. I'll tell you where your money is going how you can save money and we can get you better. And he was like, yeah, I'm down. So he sent me all this stuff and I did the analysis and I, and I made the video. Um, didn't go anywhere at the time. But like, were the, what was the biggest recommendation for him? I'm, I'm invested well, in the story of you helping this barista with his finances. I like, mean, he was living in Newark, which is kind of in Fremont and he didn't have a car. So he would Uber to work every single day, which cost him 30 bucks a day. Each, each way was 30 bucks. And his hourly me. wage is about like $10. His hourly wage was probably like, I don't know what it was, but it, with tips, maybe 20, 25 bucks. So he's basically spending more than an hour of his working time just to get to where get he to works. Work. Yeah. So with his spending breakdown, I think he was spending like $800 a month on Uber. He would get rides back, which was nice because right. he, he worked, or he lived with someone who worked there yeah, at the cafe right. as well. Yeah. But he was spending $809 on Uber. And I was like, dude, you can just get a used car if you can, you know, you can get a used car for less than that. You know, car payment on a used car is like 300 
300 bucks. You should just do that. It'll save you a bunch of money. Um, obviously there's maintenance and stuff, et cetera, et cetera. But the way that he was spending on Uber was too much. And then he was just spending random money, you know, convenience stores, random here and there, hundred bucks here and there. And so we kind of cut that down. So what's, do you know, like, what did he do next? Like, what's he doing now? I don't know what he does now. I think, I think the last I heard from him, he had a car, which was great. So, so in that same year, he did get the car, which is good. He started saving more money, which is great. Um, and I think he moved to the East Bay somewhere. Somewhere north the, East Bay. The reason I ask East, is yeah. I think that people's financial habits are so ingrained in them from a young age, from mm. like what I saw my parents do, like yep. how my parents treated and thought about money. Like both of us, we grew up with very frugal, mm. money conscious Asian dads. Yep. And I think yeah. that really shaped both of our trajectories around like we're now doing riskier things, but it came from having spent years building up some level of financial cushion of frugality. And I think there are people who grew up in really different circumstances now who are looking and saying the middle class is disappearing. People are rich as f How do I get there? Desperate for advice. And that's why they watch you. Like the same way you're helping this barista make money, sure. you're trying to help everyone at scale. And I, I think that's actually why they trust you more than Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett is almost the financial wizard for a previous generation where mm. the middle class existed more, where homes cost maybe twice of your wage where you could do very well just by investing in stocks and that's it. Sure. And now I feel like there's so many more things you need to do. Like, hey, if you make $20 an hour, don't Uber at $30 to get to your place of employment. Yeah, life has gotten a little more complicated, I would say, right? Yeah. And so, uh, but it's also gotten more, I would say there are more opportunities than ever before. Like back mm -hmm. in the 50s, you might just work at your, you know, the paper mill down the street. Right. And, you know, you make your median income, you have a nice median house, but that's it. These days you can do almost anything. Like yeah, you, you started a poster business off yeah. of memes. Exactly. And, and that's what I think is also something that the younger generation should try to leverage is like, how can we leverage the internet to make more money? Right. Yeah. Or how, or, or get new opportunities because what we're doing right now, this didn't exist yeah. to even 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And there's so many different ways to make money online now that I think you know, if you're a little savvy and you put a little bit of work into it, 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 it can it can happen. So now if we were to zoom back in time mm. to Humphrey out of college, do you think you would make the same decisions or you do something different? Uh, I would probably take an entrepreneurial risk a little bit earlier. I think in general, I'm more risk averse, but, but, but back then I was even more risk averse. Yeah. So knowing that I was going to live at home for the next, I don't know, 10 years, I probably would have like taken a oh, risk a lot earlier. It's like a 22 year old Humphrey, you will be living with your dad for the next decade. Yeah. But, uh, I probably would have done that sooner. And, and at 22, I was playing a lot of League of Legends. I probably would have cut back on the video. But in games. a way it helped you get jobs True. in gaming, yeah. which ended up well, I mean, today your content isn't focused around gaming. No, but I think being a gamer really helps um, just in general. I think huh. some of the best YouTubers that I know used to be gamers, right? They're really focused on like the analytics and they treat it like a game mm. and like, how can we grow this? What are our weaknesses? Where can we min-max certain things? And I like so, that. Uh, yeah, a lot of, I noticed that a lot of great gamers translate to good entrepreneurs just yeah. because if you're watching this, you're a gamer, you're probably a good entrepreneur at heart because yeah. there's a lot of management of different things within a video game. If you're playing a role-playing game, you have to manage the economy, the in-game economy. You have to manage other people. Oftentimes mm. you're talking to other people and like you're trying to, you know, trade for a certain item. Uh, if you're playing League of Legends, you have to deal with toxic people. Yeah. And like, that's like a management trait, right? Like how do you deal with someone yelling at you 24 seven in, in the group chat and you're trying to accomplish a mission, which is to win the game. I actually noticed I was able to win more League of Legends games as long as I was positive in the chat. So even when something was going wrong, I'd be like, don't worry, guys, we got this. Even if I didn't myself believe it. You just say it. But I would just type it. And then every time someone did something good, I'd, I'd reinforce it. Like, oh, great job. Great job. And I won a lot of games just from like chatting, I think. More so than wow. actually playing well. It's you're like, basically like, hey, like my actual skills questionable but i'll be your spiritual cheerleader <laughs> well I, I, my skills were good too oh, okay no you're I like, did, hey, i just want you to know <laughs> i did get to diamond back in the day okay this was season two so i was good never like world championship level good but i did think that i got there because of good like 
I would say rapport with my teammates. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this makes so much sense to me also because the competitive nature of gaming mm -hmm. translates well to life because in gaming, obviously you want to win and you have these very yeah. quantifiable ways of seeing whether you're winning and losing. Mm -hmm. And in life, like we all want to be happy and rich and successful. Sure, and there's like this really weird set of thinking you have to do on like, why well, I, I want all these things but I have to do things here and now that are like disconnected from the eventual outcomes. Like they are connected, but I don't yeah. like see it immediately. How do I get myself to make a TikTok video every day for over 200 days when I'm starting at day one mm -hmm. and it seems so unattainable. And I, I think part of that does come from gaming. You kind of learn to like, no, if I've seen if I try hard and I put in the time, eventually I can get there. That's true. I think that's true of almost anything in life. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a really long-term time horizon, and you're consistent with it every single day, and you make it easier for yourself. You you make them bite-sized chunks instead. Like for example, I'm on a running plan right now. Mm -hmm. I'm so, I was supposed to run six miles tomorrow. I don't want to run six miles. My friend just texted me. He's like, "Listen, go for a three mile run. Yeah, and see how you feel tomorrow. Because like you just got to get over the hump of starting. But the six miles seems really daunting to me. The longest I've ever ran was like last week, and it was seven and a half, and my I was dead." But six miles still seems really long to me. So tomorrow, if I wake up early enough, I'll go for a three-mile run. Something. And I'm sure by the time I hit three miles, psychologically, I'd be like, I might as well go for the next right. three. You know what I mean? So sometimes it's just about keeping it bite-sized, manageable tasks for you to do every day. And so you mentioned that if you could travel back in time and talk to younger Humphrey, mm. in addition to saying, move out of your parents' house earlier and spend you know a little less time gaming, there's value there, yeah. you would have started YouTube earlier. Now I wish, yeah. <laughs> You just told me you made three videos that didn't do well, right? The mm -hmm. first one was an introduction where you're just like, hi, I'm Humphrey, watch. Yep. The second one was reviewing this barista spending financial habits. What was the third video? The retirement guide video that we were talking about earlier. Ah, uh, right, where you're saying, here's the difference between a 401k, an IRA, a Roth, a traditional, yep. a SEP IRA, a solo 401k. Mm -hmm. And then you basically completely swapped over to TikTok, like you said, making a video a day for over 200 days. Mm -hmm. And... Now, what is the big focus? You've built a following. You make over, what, $200,000 mm -hmm. a year off of YouTube. Like, yep. what interests you next? So it's still being relevant on YouTube, I think. YouTube is my main focus mm. probably for the next three to five, maybe even seven years. I think it's a really great platform. I still think it's like the number one platform to be as a creator. TikTok and Instagram are great. They're great for getting your exposure out there. But I think for building a deep connection, really teaching financial literacy, which is what I want to do, in a long format way is where you're going to get the most value. And so yeah. I, that's where I view myself on YouTube. I'd like to just just be better, create better videos, mm. get better every every day. Yeah. When you think back, we've talked a lot about like lessons you've learned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Have, yeah. You're like, oh, like hard work, persistence, like leveraging your strengths. What are things you feel like you had to unlearn? Things that you do differently now that like, you know, 22 year old Humphrey might not have realized something that I had to unlearn was like learning that <laughs> unlearn learning that it's okay to go backwards. Mm. So like we do a lot of experiments on our channel and I know that if it's really easy to roll back that experiment, then it's fine. Like you just don't, you want to unlearn the fact that like, I guess that like you think by choosing one decision that's locking you in forever. Mm. And I used to think that way, like, oh, if I do this type of content, like that's going to lock me into that niche forever or that style forever. But I know that you can always kind of roll it back. So yeah, I guess I, that's kind of something I've learned. I, I saw on your podcast with Graham Stephan, you did a collaboration with Brian Chung. Or yeah. you said like, I think it was like, here are like the stocks you pick if you like want to play in the metaverse or something. I, I don't think it was a collaboration. I think we yeah. both made a similar video at the time. You both yes. made a video at the time. But I remember you said something to Graham. You're like, oh, this is not actually representative of like how I actually pick stocks or like the con and I want to do. Yeah. 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 I think at the time, this was November 21, maybe, or mm -hmm. November 20. Yeah. November 21. I was pretty desperate for views. I just wanted something to pop off. And um, I did what you should probably not do as a YouTuber, which is like chase views, right? It kind of went against the mission of the channel. Now that I know that, I didn't really know what the mission of the channel was back in the day. I've worked a lot on what's my North Star goal, what my mission should be. And so looking back on that, I realized like that that's the type of video that doesn't hit the mission. And I think that I wasn't comfortable with the video, I guess, doing, I guess I was fine with it doing well at the time. I thought it was great for the YouTube channel to get that ex, that much exposure. Yeah. But I think 
Yeah, I, I'm not, it's not my proudest video, but what do you mean by like desperate for views? <laughs> like what was going on there? Yeah, I think when you become somebody who makes videos, you just want to blow up as quickly as possible. Like, and when you don't see it for so long, and YouTube is a game of plateaus, right? You you grow, you plateau for a very and long time. Until you get the next pop off, the and next And then you hit, might pop off And it brings again. you to a new plateau. Yes. And so sometimes when you're in those plateaus, especially early on as a YouTuber, when you're only getting like a yeah. thousand views a video, or maybe even less, 500 views, 100 views a video, you just want to see something positive go your way. Mm. And so I was kind of in that, I was grasping for, you know, anything that I could make that I knew like, okay, this will, this will probably hit, this will hit. Um, but that's not how you build a really long lasting sustainable brand, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can't just like do whatever's trending all the time. Oh, maybe you can, but I guess in, in the financial world, you want to build right. you know, a good long, long-term brand. So what, what do you think is the Humphrey brand? I asked Patty Galloway this, what he thought the, the Humphrey brand was. And he said, presumably paid him money for this as well. <laughs> yeah. So let's hear the answer. I love you, Patty. Uh, Patty is actually the best though. Yes. Yeah. He said, and I agree with him. It's calm and rational. It's calm, rational, data backed, data driven type of type of stuff. When you come to a video of mine, you feel safe. You feel like you're mm -hmm. gonna get something explained to you really clearly, that you're gonna know a little bit more about financial literacy or whatever topic is at hand, and you're gonna have some sort of actionable item to go off of. So like, you know, if the car market bubble just popped, sort of, you you know that maybe in ninety or 90 to 120 days based on all this data that that's probably the best time to buy a car maybe in 90 days not now but in 90 days right and so and it's calm and rational and explain to you not clickbaited hopefully and you know very uh yeah matter of fact and yeah i love that i mean i've wa was watching your videos they're not clickbait at all <laughs> Like sometimes the thumbnails can be a little bit. I apologize for you. Yeah, sometimes the thumbnails. I mean, you can could be. have gone like way more yes. aggressive with the thumbnails. They're like pretty understated. The titles are pretty simple. You know, you're not like you know. Here are like the five things right. that if you don't do, you're you're screwed forever. Like here's how I made millions of dollars. You're pretty straightforward. It's a constant battle to I like mean, figure out how much to lean into. There used to be you know some appeal versus not. Yeah, hurting yeah. your brand and what you want yeah. to do. I spend a lot of time on title and mm. thumbnail and uh, I've got a great thumbnail designer. We yeah. come up with one or two concepts per video now. And uh, I, I'm awful at graphic design, by the way. I used to make all my own thumbnails. And so, um, but once I hired a thumbnail designer, that's a great, great right. octopus leg to cut off as MKBHD would call it. Like if you're bad at certain things you outsource it first is that what, i didn't never heard that before He's, it's cutting off the octopus leg yeah so like if you're a creator you got like eight octopus legs right like thumbnails yeah. filming, one, editing, filming editing monetizing yeah. writing community brand deals right. taxes uh content strategy you can cut off these arms but you still need to keep some arms right like what your heart is good at what's the i love we're having this discussion what's the octopus arm humphrey you want to keep okay so i'm definitely keeping the writing Oh, you that script yourself. Yeah, I script yeah. myself and uh, the voice is myself because I've tried to hire writers before. Yeah. It's always a little bit different. It's not in your voice. And, you know, I want to make sure that the data or not the data, the the, the information is factual and correct. Uh, I did have something else to tell you about, though, when you were talking about the thumbnails. Oh, we can always go more clickbait, but I, I intentionally try to bring it back a little bit. So I know that there are titles out there that can get me more clicks but I think in the short term, and that would work, but in the long term, I'd rather go well, for just like a good, hmm. like clean titles, clean, clean as in like reasonable titles that still get you to click. What's an example of a title you have now that's pretty clean that you could have made 50 times for clickbait? My data-backed investing plan for 2024 could have been my investing plan for 2024 that will make me $5 million in a year, you know, something like that. And then the thumbnail could be like total balance, 5 million, and I could be like pointing at it and... You know, you know what I mean? Like you could totally make it way more clickbait or like if the market ever tanks one day, you could, you could say like recession incoming, what, you know, you could do something like that. So we try to avoid these now, although I do acknowledge that sometimes for the short term, it would be better to have those titles. Um, so it's something I wrestle with quite a lot. It's powerful though, because not only is it good for your viewers and good for your brand, it's also good for the economy. There's this concept, sure. animal spirits. John Maynard Keynes, okay. economist who many people it. followed after the depression on how to address depressions. He said that so much of what we do is driven by animal spirits. 
And there used to be this conception of the perfectly efficient market, right? Like markets know how to price assets correctly because there's so many people out there who are smart and rational. Whenever news comes out, they quickly adjust. Okay, this is now what I think this thing is worth. But the efficient market hypothesis never adjusted or predicted for TikTok <laughs> and Reddit. Yeah. And people go, diamond hands, yeah. diamond hands. Sure. So when I say animal spirits, it refers to this concept like sometimes we are not rational. We just do crazy ass things. Sure. Oh, and yeah. yeah, see, exactly. That leads to weird financial decisions where like you can spark bank runs as an influencer just by shouting that it's going to fail. And it becomes a self-fulfilling mm -hmm. prophecy. That's actually what happened partially with SVB, Silicon Valley Bank. No bank, as you know, ever actually has enough cash on hand to mm -hmm. satisfy all deposits. The point of a bank is to provide liquidity, giving people capital and loans from the deposits they have with the expectation you're not going to have everyone come in at the exact same time to get your money. And part of what made this bank run happen, two things come to mind. The first is, all of the big venture capital firms, a lot of them panicked and said, take your money out now. And so everyone's like, if Andreessen Horowitz is saying I should do this, I probably should. The second thing was the head of Silicon Valley Bank jumped on a Zoom call to like reassure people and it was not reassuring. Yeah. <laughs> people just panicked more. Yeah. And I think you can take this as an example for what's going on for the economy in general. A friend of mine, Kyla Scanlon, who's a- Kyla, yeah. Yeah, like, you know Kyla. Like she wrote a piece in the New York Times about- the vibe session yep. where like a lot of like traditional economic metrics are actually fine, but it feels like we're in a recession. And if it just feels like you're in a recession, you can actually make a recession happen. So much of this now sits on your shoulders and your peers as financial mm. influencers because people listen to what you say. So when I hear you describe and be like, hey, Eric, I could have made this thumbnail and title 50 times more clickbait, but I didn't. I'm like, wow, that's like taking the harder path that short term makes you less money, but long term also is like potentially better for the economy. Yeah, 100%. Um, Kyla and I have talked about the idea that inflation is a self fulfilling prophecy, too. You know, if the narrative in the media is everything's going up in price, then businesses are going to reflect that narrative. They're like, oh, I just heard that on CNN that the prices are going up. Like, I got to make sure that I can cover my wages. So I got to raise my prices too. And then it just becomes this kind of like self-fulfilling prophecy. So a lot of uh, mon monetary policy and economics is really interesting because it's all psychological and it's all narrative based. And it's like what we tell, what we tell people um, kind of drives behavior. So it's really interesting. Very fair I also point. appreciate too, like as a financial influencer, you also have to make a living. And yeah. there's AdSense, but there's also brand deals and affiliates. God, don't get me started. And how do you decide, like, what's the line as a financial creator for taking a brand deal from a company? Because on the one hand, look, you're being upfront. This is an advertisement. On the other hand, we've seen over the past few years, FTX, people just get really upset and go after you regardless. It's really hard. I would say as a financial creator, especially, you always want to use the product or be proud of the product that you are promoting. That's always number one, right? Number two is something I'm wrestling with right now is like, should I still promote products that could potentially lose the viewer money? Mm. For example, if I promoted an ETF, let's just say it's a new ETF company and they're like, hey, Humphrey, we want you to promote this ETF and you know your investors could could make money in it or they could lose money in it. Is, what's my fiduciary responsibility as a content creator? I don't really have a fiduciary responsibility, right. but I like to operate that way. Legally, you don't. Legally, I don't, but... As a financial advisor, I used to be like a, fid a fiduciary, so I still like to operate in the viewer's best interest. And so when I consider some brand deals these days, I always think, could this lose the viewer money? And if the answer is yes, we tend to lean against it, especially on YouTube. On TikTok and Instagram, I still don't know how I feel. I think it should be blanket across mm. across all platforms. But the problem is, is if I do that, then sometimes I don't make enough money for that month to cover, let's say, payroll and expenses. Right, which supports the broader mission of providing yeah. Americans and citizens of the world with basic financial education. It is, yes. So it is a very difficult line to tow. Yeah. And I'm constantly battling with that. Like, obviously, if I was just sponsored by, let's say, I don't know, what's my dream brand? TaylorMade Golf. 
like, please sponsor me or something like that. Most brands like TaylorMade Golf do not want to sponsor a financial creator. It's only financial brands that want to. So it's really tough. It's tough. It's hard to, because I, I think about it from the perspective of a creator. As you said, there is an actual legal fiduciary responsibility. Mm -hmm. And you're always up front, like this is an advertisement. But what makes it so tricky is people see and trust you as so much more than here's a YouTuber telling me an advertisement. They internalize it. And I saw a lot of people hold you responsible, even though you were so clear on what the product was and what your involvement with it is. It's like really scary when it yeah, comes to money. You see that with the FTX stuff. I mean, I mean, nobody knew, yeah. right? Like after the fact, yeah, it's easy to point fingers, but you know, even Sequoia Capital didn't know. Exactly. You I've know? seen the headlines that there's all these lawsuits against celebrities and creators from involved with FTX. I think those lawsuits are mm -hmm. like, I understand the pain of the people who suffered, but I also don't know if it was on Tom Brady to do the financial due diligence on a company right. that like Sequoia wasn't even able to spot the flags on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Hard line to tell. I agree. It is a hard line to tell and we're constantly working on it. So if you see an advertisement on my channel, please know it comes from a good place. But yeah. Humphrey's literally just <laughs> trying to support the channel for its mission sure. and being thoughtful about what you bring on. Exactly. What would you say now as a creator sure. has changed in, like we're talking about your viewers, that it's like this amorphous mass, mm -hmm. right? How often do you like meet them or run into them in real life? Uh, pretty often, I would say once every few days, once a week, yeah. definitely. If I'm in the airport, yesterday it happened when I was at the airport. Um, viewers are there, you never know when it happens, but it's really nice and, and I appreciate it. And then we, I have a Discord community, so I inter interact with a lot of the fans in there as well. And there's a channel where you can ask me any question. So I usually answer all the questions in there. I, I like the Discord community, so. Do you think you'll ever begin to move from just financial advice to life advice? Because I feel like mm. you're, today in this pod, you've shared a lot about your own journey and what you learned. And it's so intimately tied together with the financial because the decisions you make in your life That's affect funny. your finances. Yeah, possibly one day. I mean, I have a lot of creator friends that come to me for life advice, really? which is funny. Yeah, See, yeah. That's what I'm saying. You know, you said how your brand is like very honest and mm. understated mm -hmm. as per Patty. Like, look at you. You look so uh, appreciate it. humble. You're like in a simple blazer. You're like, well, I'm here to talk about what I do. You know, this yeah. is how much I make. What When they come to you for life advice, what are they asking usually? They usually, you know, they come to me with very similar things that we've talked about today. Oh, my views are down. Do you think like this, yeah. is, this is on brand? Um, should I hire a writer for my content or what makes my content special? You know, sometimes it's good to have an outside eye or, you know, I'll get calls from other creators. Like, do you think this title and thumbnail are good? Right. I'm not a YouTube strategist by any means. I've just been trained very well by Patty Galloway, but I know a little bit about titles and thumbnails and I love YouTube. So I've seen many titles and thumbnails in my life. Same with Sebi, you know, you know, ask, ask Sebi. Sebi or same with this guy. His name's Nick Barberi in, uh, his name, he goes by SGC Barbarian. He advises a number of different YouTube channels. Yeah. yeah. I like talking with people that have been on the platform for a long, for a very long time, yeah. especially on YouTube, because they've seen everything. Mm. And so as YouTube historians, as I like to call them, that's what I call them, they have a general intuition of what titles and thumbnails will do well. Right. And I think I've watched enough YouTube where I have that same intuition now but I didn't have that all the time. But Not, I think like, you know, know, like, you know, when you hear a good title and, th and you see the thumb, you're like, oh, that's going to hit. Yeah, it's the experience. Not to mention getting used to the ups and downs. Right. Because like you said, there was a period when you went on Graham's podcast, you're like, oh my God, I like really need views. Like what do I do? What's my brand identity? I've also seen you previously say on another podcast, like you're meditating. You have oh, a journal. Yeah. Your thoughts are your thoughts. I think that's something you've said before. I've been meditating for a year straight. Wow. Almost a year straight now and uh, like 365 straight days, 20 minutes every day in the morning. And I'm supposed to do an afternoon one. It's called um, Vedic meditation or transcendental meditation. It's literally you just sit there for 20 minutes and you don't think about anything and just, well, you try not to think about anything, but whatever comes your way are your thoughts. And it's really kind of grounded me mm -hmm. and I really enjoy it. So what got you started into this and what have been the benefits? Uh, yeah, a girl got me started into it because it's I was a girl. It's I was a really, girl. I was really stressed out about a situation where this girl, she was a little bit avoidant. She would sometimes give me some positive signals that she liked me and then oftentimes would pull away very quickly 
And I had a really anxious time navigating that. Yeah. Like I definitely was more of an anxious attachment type of dater. And so I really valued the validation of hearing texts from her or hearing that she wanted to hang out with me. And this whole month was really tough. I was still living at home and, you know, she was like, I had one itis. Like, I love this girl. I didn't like this, didn't love this girl, but I was very into the idea of like dating this girl. And so I was like, man, I can't manage my own anxiety and my own emotions around this situation. I can't control. So I need to look elsewhere. And one of my friend's moms, my friend's name is Barrett. And his mom is a meditator and she trains with a guru named Sad Guru. If she's watching this, Nikki, she's great. And so she she recommended that I try Vedic meditation through one of uh, a friend of a friend of hers. And so I, I did that and it's been great. Yeah. I have been in similar situations. Well, good. Anxious and avoidant people typically date each other because when you're perfectly secure yeah. and you find another secure person, you quickly pair off and you're no longer in the dating pool. So it's primarily anxious and avoiding people. Mm. Avoiding people, Humphrey, can't date each other because they're too avoidant. <laughs> there's two, they just repel, they're like magnets repelling yeah, each other. Yeah, if like someone's playing hard to get and the other person's playing hard to get, it's like, well, f you too, bye. Yeah. Yeah. So what usually ends up happening is avoiding people end up with anxious people because mm -hmm. the anxious people are so afraid, and I've been on the anxious spectrum myself more, that I have to work so hard to get close to get this affection and love. And the avoiding people have been so trained to like, I need to distance myself, it's mm -hmm. gonna be overwhelming. You feed on each other. Yep. I totally get when someone's avoiding tendencies are just sparking your anxiety. And you started in a way, it brought you to a great place because you started meditation because mm -hmm. of it. I've got to ask that what happened to the girl? Are you still seeing her? No, no. That was only like, we only went on three dates. Uh, she ended up, I don't know. I just, we just didn't talk See, after that. He's, you've so transcended <laughs> yeah, the initial I mean, problem. That she'll still reach out to me sometimes as a friend, as friendly Right. On friendly terms, and she has a boyfriend now, and I think she moved, but you know, right. I, so it all it all works. It out. all worked out. Yeah, I mentioned to you before we started the pod, but a huge reason why I began this because I was excited going through a breakup. Oh right? yeah, where you just have all the excess emotional energy, <laughs> all the anxiety, and for me, what's always helped is you just you just talk about it, you just yeah. talk it through. And there's such a funny thing, at least what I've experienced with my guy friends. Okay, where a lot of my guy friends, like you know, we'll hang out, we'll like get dinner, we'll play video games, right? We'll like go play pickleball. But it's sometimes hard as opposed to my female friends. We're like, let's just like get together and talk. But that changes when you put a mm. podcast microphone in there. Suddenly you have guys who like never talk about anything. You put a microphone and they're like, yeah, I, you know, it did start with my dad. Yeah, it's interesting because I probably wouldn't have shared that with you. Yeah, um, if we were just casually running into we each other somewhere. Talking. Yeah. Right, there's something about the format which I really love. And yeah. so- on the note, I want to say, uh, Humphrey, thank you so much for making time, man. I really appreciate it. This thank is fun. Thank you for having me. I appreciate being here, and it's really cool what you've built. Thank you, man. All right. That's that's a wrap. How are you feeling? Handshake. Yeah, feel pretty good. Thanks.